Welcome everybody, I'm uh, Andre and it's my pleasure to present uh, TLBDR for you today. So, um, what's this talk going to be about? So, it, in principle, it's a new technique to reverse engineer TLBs um, that we can use to measure previously undocumented properties, obtaining optimal eviction patterns for uh, adversarial eviction, and this nets us up to 2x improvements for real-world attacks. So, stay tuned for more if you want to uh, learn any more. So, um, we're going to talk about a couple of things today. So, first off, we're going to introduce what TLBs are, uh, what they do. We're going to introduce our new technique, the desynchronization. Um, we're going to talk about how we use this to uh, uh, reverse engineer the TLB. Then we're going to talk about how uh, these new reverse engineering uh, results allow us to manipulate TLB state and uh, create these optimal eviction sets. And finally, we're going to look at some case studies. So first, what are TLBs? Well, um, let's get uh, back a bit and talk about why TLBs are needed. So every uh, process in the system nowadays thinks it's running on all of the memory. And this is enabled by virtual memory, but at some point, these, all of these memory areas need to be mapped to physical memory. And this is commonly done on, on modern hardware using page tables. And as an example, on x86, you have a virtual address. You split it into a couple of chunks that you use to then uh, index into these page tables. So you have a root page table. You take this bit of the address, you index into it, points you to another uh, table, you keep indexing and you keep doing this over and over again until finally you get to the end and it points to an actual address in, in physical memory that you can access. But you can now see that for every memory access, you suddenly introduce four more memory accesses. So that gives you a 4x overhead, which is absolutely silly. Nobody wants to deal with, uh, with all of this. So how do you mitigate this problem? Well, as always, caching. So what if we just took this virtual address, took the uh, bits that we used to, um, to index into the page tables, we put it in a magic box called the TLB, and it tells us, hey, just go there in physical memory and all is fine. Or if it doesn't have the entry, it just tells us, yeah, no idea. And then only then we can go uh, walk the actual page tables. Now, why do we care about TLBs? Obviously for performance, that's why they were um, invented, but this is a security conference, so what, a what happened? Okay, never mind. But what about security? So um, the TLB is a part of the microarchitectural state, so it's not directly accessible to any programs. However, um, <clears throat> uh, this TLB state can still have visible side effects, uh, or side effects visible in uh, architectural state. And if the TLB state happens to depend on any sensitive data, these side effects turn into side channels, which is really, really bad for sensitive applications. Um, let's look at an example. Say our target on, on the left here uh, has two possible code paths it can uh, go through. Say on code path A, it acts as a particular memory address, therefore, uh, loading an entry into the TLB, or rather hitting an entry in the TLB. And for code path B, it doesn't do that. Simple. Uh, what an attacker has to do is just simply evict the TLB, or you know, keep accessing entries in the TLB, you know, just en entry after entry, and time the accesses. So right now, if, say, the target goes on code path A, uh, it would access that entry. And when the attacker goes and measures this, it would measure a higher uh, access time than usual, so it knows that uh, the target accessed uh, or went on code path A. However, if it goes on code path B, the attacker just hits his own uh, their own entries already, so it gets a low time, so it knows uh, it went the target went on code path B. Now, <clears throat> we see that evicting the TLB or uh, is a very very crucial uh, aspect to this TLB side channel. Now. Um, there are quite a couple of other attacks using the TLB. So they, yeah, of course, there are TLB side channels uh, that we've that I've talked about, um, exemplified by the TLB TLB lead attack. But there is also um, MMU side channels. So uh, the MMU, when it's walking the page tables, leaves traces in the uh, data caches, which can also be measured and used to um, to as a side channel to attack a system. And finally, more recently, there has been row hammer by way of page table walks. Um, and the PT Hammer project. So understanding TLBs and especially their evictions is quite important for, the, uh, for these novel attacks. Now, let's talk about reverse engineering TLBs. Uh, so up to this point, all reverse engineering has been done uh, in general as part of attack uh, 
projects or attack um, um, development. So TLBleed uh, did some basic reverse engineering of Intel TLBs and they used access timing. So they would just time the memory accesses and uh, distinguish between TLB hits and misses that way. And also there was the RevANC project, which uh, used a timing side channel as well, but on the last level caches um, to measure uh, the page table walks. And they, they could only measure the uh, capacity of the TLB. As opposed to these, our uh, key premise, our starting premise is that TLBs do not ensure any coherence with page tables. So as opposed to um, data caches, which if you change something in RAM, they have very elaborate coherency protocols to make sure that every level of the cache is either invalid or contains valid data that is mirrored in RAM. TLBs don't do that. They, they, they don't bother with that. They just say in the architecture manual, the operating system is responsible for invalidating any TLB entries. So how do we use this? Well, um, let's say we have this TLB. Uh, which um, gets loaded with a uh, with an entry pointing to the right uh, memory in physical uh, to the right location in physical memory. Um, now, if we say invalidate the page tables from underneath it, any further access that still hits the TLB will take us to uh, the correct location in physical memory. However, if the entry gets evicted for any reason and we walk the page tables, the hardware sees that oh wait that page table entry is invalid, and it faults. And this isn't anything new. In the early 2000s, this was used to implement uh, non-executable or to simulate a non-executable bit on CPUs that didn't have one. But we can do something even cleverer. So if we go uh, back to our previous situation, instead of invalidating the entry in the last level page table, what if we just change it around? So now the TLB points to one place, the page tables to another. And any TLB hit will point us to the original location. And if the entry goes out of the TLB and page tables get walked, we go to the other location. If we put different data in those locations, suddenly we can distinguish a TLB hit from a TLB miss. So reliably distinguishing TLB hits and misses without using any timing side channel is a very powerful primitive. But OK, we have the primitive. What do we actually use it for? So reverse engineering. Um, pardon? So right, we can use the synchronization to perform reverse engineering. Um, and a couple of issues that, uh, or questions that we, we faced in, in the beginning. So how do we implement this? Um, well, we have to muck about with page tables, and that's a privileged operation. So we should be in the kernel. So we just made a Linux kernel module. Uh, what do we run on? So we just looked around our office and grabbed the most convenient uh, hardware around, and that was Intel consumer CPUs. Shocker, some of you might actually be using Intel right now. Um, but that, there was also um, another reason for this, uh, other than convenience, is that there was already previous reverse engineering work on Intel TLBs that we can use to validate our results, because it's always good to check whatever results you have with somebody else's work. Uh, finally, what experiments did we um, develop, and uh, what did we measure? Well. In order to talk about that, at least briefly, we need to go into how TLBs actually work and how, how they're built. So first of all, we have to think about their topology. What does that mean? Well, the TLB can be just one single box, like we've uh, seen in previous examples, just one magic box that uh, takes care of all of your entries. However, it could also be a hierarchy. So you have a smaller, faster level one cache, which when uh, missed would just uh, continue uh, asking the slower, larger level two cache. You could have a split TLB where one part of the TLB, the data TLB handles all data accesses and the instruction TLB handles all instruction fetches. You could have both. So you could have a hierarchical TLB and a split TLB at the same time, or even uh, more interesting, you could have a split level one with a shared unified level two. So there are quite a couple of topologies to choose from and we need to measure which one's which. So we measured this and in, yeah, Intel CPUs turns out they have a split level one and a unified shared L2. Uh, second, um, we have to think about inclusivity. So what does that mean is where entries can be in a hierarchical uh, cache. So an inclusive cache needs to have uh, entries that are in higher levels. So lower numbered levels necessarily need to be in, uh, in, in lower levels as well. So, an entry that is in L1 always needs to be in L2. So this is valid. 
This is also valid because the entry is in L2 but not in L1. This, however, isn't in an inclusive TLB. You could have an exclusive TLB where an entry may be present in one uh, level at most. So this is valid, the entry is not present. It could be in L1, could be in L2, never in both. You could have a third option. Pardon? You have a third option, neither, which means that it can, entries can be anywhere. So it can be in L1, but in both, in L2, whatever. So what do the Intel CPUs do? Neither. So an entry can be anywhere. Uh, third, what happens on loads and evictions? So say we load a particular entry into the TLB. Where do we put it? Do we put it in L1, in L2, in both? Furthermore, if say you have an entry in L2 and you hit it, do you move it to L1 for performance reasons? Furthermore, if you have an entry in L1 and you need to evict it, do you push it back into L2 or do you just throw it away? And if you do push it into L2, the technical name for this is a victim cache. So a couple of more questions. So what happens yeah, on load, eviction, victim caches? The result is a load populates both levels at least on Intel, eviction, all evictions get dropped, no victim caches. Now, we've seen what happens in the interactions between uh, TLB levels, and, but how about the individual TLB components, just zooming in on, on that magic box? So for that, of course, we need to get more into the nitty gritty details of how these are uh, implemented. So you have a TLB with a couple of entries right here. You have an, a particular entry that you want to put into the TLB. Where can you uh, put it. You could just put it anywhere, and that would be called a fully associative TLB. However, if you can put it anywhere, you need to look everywhere when you want to find it. And that's quite impractical to implement in hardware. And the common solution is just to uh, select a subset of the TLB to, uh, to put every entry in. And uh, that subset is called, well, a set. And uh, such a TLB is called n-way associative. And in this case, it will be four-way associative because you can put it in four different places. And splitting the TLB this way, or any cache for that matter, uh, you can split it into sets and ways. So sets are the subsets of the TLB that a particular entry can be uh, put into, and ways are the entries of a set. Now, how do you pick the actual set? Because, okay, we just said, yeah, we, we allocate to every entry one subset of the TLB, but how do you, exactly do you pick it? Well, going a step back, what is an entry? It's just a mapping uh, between a virtual and a physical address. That's it. So a simple way to do it is just take that virtual address, put it through a hash function that then spits out a set that you need to put it in. Great. So now we have a couple of experiments for e each individual TLB component. So we have Associativity, the numbers of ways and sets, we found that. Um, the set selection or the hash function for every particular uh, microarchitecture, we found that as well. However, there's one more question we haven't addressed, is how do ways get picked for eviction? Or rather, if you have this situation, which way do you put this entry in? Um, so something like way selection. And yeah, this has a proper term, it's called a replacement policy. Um, and its goal is to evict entries out of a set in order to maximize the likelihood of future hits. Now, the future is unknowable, so we can't really do this, but usually the past is a good approximation of the future. So uh, a common textbook implementation of this will be least recently used. You just keep track of every entry access and you kick out the least recently used whenever you have to evict something. However, this is also quite costly to implement in hardware because you have to keep a counter for every individual uh, way and update them and, and so on. So what's the, solu what's the solution? Why does this keep happening? Sorry. Uh, solution approximate, uh, but how? Well, let's go through a couple of our um, reverse engineering results and uh, I'll explain. So one uh, common method of approximating this is the pseudo LRU, uh, implemented using a binary tree. So here you can see it's just three bits that uh, keep the ordering for a four-way set. So in this case, you, f uh, you would follow the arrows and they would point you to the next eviction victim. So in case we would have a TLB miss and we would need to evict it and load another entry, you would 
follow these arrows, kick out the, uh, the entry colored red, and then take those arrows and flip them to the other direction, or rather flip the, the bits in, in the node that, um, that you traverse to get to it. So the new state would be this. And this would be the new eviction uh, victim. Now, if, if you were to hit a particular uh, entry in this um, configuration, you would follow the, um, the path uh, down to it, and when you encounter a, an arrow, you flip it. If you don't encounter an arrow, you just leave it alone. So right now, we would just, so the top one is, is in the right position, the bottom one gets flipped. So we'd have this situation. Simple enough, right? Well, here's another uh, replacement policy we found. Um, that name is absolutely silly. Don't, don't, don't pay it any attention. Uh, so how is it built is actually you take one of these trees that we discussed about, you actually take three of them, put them together, and you unify them with a node up top. Now this isn't a binary tree, it's a ternary node, which keeps track of the most recently used uh, binary tree. So in this case, say it would be the center one. And then it also keeps, uh, so it, it marks the, and the tree to the right of the most recently used one, for next eviction. So this would be this. In case the, uh, the MRU line would have been on the left, the eviction victim would have been the middle tree, and so on. Now, similar to before, if you simply follow the arrows, you find your next eviction victim. And when on a miss, you would flip the, uh, the bottom arrows as before. However, on the, uh, on the upper node, we would move the MRU line to that uh, position. So on the upper node, you move the MRU line to the right, so the uh, eviction line goes to the leftmost one. So there you can see the, um, the new eviction victim. Now, what happens if we actually hit uh, an entry here? Similar to before, we walk down the tree to find it. Uh, the, the binary tree at the bottom, similar to before, we just flip a, a single um, arrow. At the top, we need to move the MRU line to the middle and the uh, next eviction line to the right, so we would have this uh, um, configuration. And you can notice that all the pointed lines uh, follow the most recently um, accessed entry. Right, um, and uh, yeah, this, uh, this particular replacement policy has previously been undocumented, so uh, yeah. Now, what do we all use this for? Um, so we've reverse engineered it, what do we do with it? So we can improve evictions. As you probably remember from before, all TLB attacks rely to some extent on evicting entries out of the TLB adversarially. So these replacement policies that we've reverse engineered allow us to in, um, model TLB state very accurately. And by, model, uh, by modeling, we gain insight into its behavior and so we can manipulate it. So what security impact does this have? Well, as we've said, Attacks will rely on evicting the TLB, all of these, and we can improve TLB eviction with this. How much? Well, let's take uh, let's take our um, newly found replacement policy and apply some clever modeling and a graph search algorithm. I won't go into details. If you want, just ask me on the hallway, and you won't get me to shut up about it. Um, and then we can uh, obtain optimal access sequences for ev evicting these. Uh, um, entries out of the TLB. So here's, uh, here's our, our, our sort of goal. So we need to evict a single target uh, adversarially out of a TLB set. The baseline that all attacks have been doing until now is use as many distinct accesses as the number of ways. So you essentially brute force the, the entire TLB set and just throw everything out. So it makes sense. It's a pigeonhole principle. If you access more entries than fit in the TLB, it will get evicted. Uh, however, it fills the TLB set entirely, evicting all non-attacker entries um, and incurs a potential TLB miss for each access, so that's also slow. Um, and honestly, this is overkill if all you want to do is evict a single target entry. So how much better can we do? Taking this uh, as an example, we've accessed 0 to 10, so 10 attacker-controlled addresses, followed by, a, by the... Um, the victim target address. Uh, don't mind the crazy ordering at the bottom, that's just how this replacement policy works. Uh, you can notice that the pointed lines point to our target, so it is the most recently accessed. 
So a naive uh, eviction right now would just access 0 through 10 and probably uh, one more as well to just flush everything out. However, we can do much, much better. So how much better? Well, let's say we access uh, entry 5 right there. It's a hit. So if it's a hit, we do as before. We walk down the tree and we only need to flip the node, that, the node that's colored in. So we flip the, uh, the arrow over to T and that's it. Next, we hit 8, which is also a hit. We walk down the tree and we see we only flip this one uh, node here and we flip it over. Third, we access 7, which you can see is there. It's also a hit. Walk down the tree and we need to change two nodes. The lower node isn't that important, but the uh, upper node, you notice that if we put the MRU line on the left, the eviction line is on the middle, and suddenly the target is our next eviction victim. And we did this using only three accesses. So right now, if we just hit uh, or access uh, an entry that isn't in the TLB, say 11, that would be a miss, and it would immediately kick out uh, our uh, target entry and replace it with 11. Uh, switching all of these uh, nodes around. All right, uh, so yeah, we've managed to evict a, uh, adversarially evict a, a target entry in just four accesses, three of which are TLB hits, and uh, the one miss that we incur is the one necessary to actually kick the, the entry out. Some cooler things about this. So the access pattern, this access pattern can be adapted and repeated for further evictions. So this 5, 8, 7, uh, 11, for the next eviction, it would be other four, for the next eviction, other four. But uh, in, in any case, in any state that you have the TLB in, there are four accesses that you can do to just kick out the um, last accessed entry. Furthermore, after six iteration, this pattern repeats. So you don't need to recalculate it every time, just need to calculate six of these patterns and then they just repeat. Great. So it's a self-contained eviction loop. Once you got the, uh, the addresses set up in, say, a pointer chase or something, it, it just works. Even better, um, the TLB ends up in the same end state regardless of whether you accessed the target or not. So say, if we go back to our, um, to our tree, right now, if we don't access our target and we still run a, an eviction loop, um, the end state of a TLB will be exactly the same whether or not uh, the target was accessed. So it's self-synchronizing. You don't need to pay attention to whether uh, your, your victim is actually active or not. You can just spin on that particular uh, eviction loop and you know it will get kicked out once it gets accessed. And yeah, performance, so three hits plus one miss versus two, 12 misses uh, for a baseline, it's much, much better. So let's uh, see a couple of case studies and uh, how these uh, optimized eviction sets actually work in real world uh, exploits. So we measure the effect of these on uh, the previously mentioned attacks. So for TL bleed style side channels, we've got a two times faster sample rate on level two and a 20% uh, improvement on level 1D. Uh, and we've made it practical to sample a particular L1 and L2 set pair, which you could technically do it naively, but it would be very, very complicated. Um, but this allows us to um, much reduce the aliasing noise uh, for a target. So you have a problem when um, doing cache measurements in general because your target isn't the only address that gets uh, into that particular set that you're targeting. There can be others that just hash to the same set. But if you select two particular uh, sets, then, then they, they number of addresses that actually hash to these two uh, sets are much lower. Uh, for the next attacks, so the page translation side channels, ANC style attacks, we can uh, break ASLR 20% faster. And for uh, PT hammer style attacks, we get a 12% increase in hammer rate, which is very significant since uh, the relationship between hammer rate and bit flip count is very uh, nonlinear. And in, in all of these cases, there were very minimal uh, modifications we needed to do on, on the actual um, attack. So this is basically a, a drop-in replacement for their uh, own eviction implementations. A couple of bonus uh, reverse engineering uh, stuff. So we noticed a couple of odd TLB misses when running some experiments. And 
turns out um, they depended on the address space identifier in use. Now, what is that? So, a bit more background. So, uh, TLBs cache virtual to physical translations, right? Um, but every individual process has its own virtual address space. So, we need to make sure that no stale entries from an older process gets used by, by a newer process. So, in theory, you would just need to flush the TLB completely on every address space switch. Uh, which is great until Meltdown came around and you needed to do that every time you did a syscall. So that became really, really slow. So what's the solution? Keep the entries in the TLB, don't flush them. But then how do you distinguish them? How do you prevent stale accesses? Well, you simply use an explicit identifier. Like when setting the, um, the root of the page table for a particular address space, you just mention a 12-bit identifier. The CPU remembers that and uh, stores it in, into the TLB and uh, checks it, it checks on, on every uh, subsequent access to make sure that uh, it's accessing the right address space. So you no longer need to flush entries and you prevent the stale entries, great. But 12 bits gives you four 4K um, address spaces. That's quite a lot. Do they actually store that? Um, can we use all of these address spaces at once? Turns out, no, uh, it's actually more complicated. So we ran a couple of experiments and across our test set, we've noticed that uh, the level one data TLB has no PCID support at all. So no, no address space identifier support. Whenever you change address spaces, it just gets flushed automatically by the hardware. Uh, level two has, a, has one four entry uh, PCID cache. So a cache that keeps these identifiers uh, per hardware thread. So if you, you end up using more than four uh, address space identifiers, it just kicks out the, uh, the, the previously, um, the least recently used one. And actually this is one of the few cases where an actual perfect LRU is implemented in hardware. And for the L1 instruction TLB, it's inconclusive, it, it was odd. So it either shares level two's PCID cache or has its own on top. Um, Second, uh, you might remember this slide from before. We ran it on Intel consumer CPUs. Well, there are other manufacturers of CPUs, so we decided to uh, try our hand at them uh, as well. Um, but there's a problem. So we tried our, our hand on AMDs and they don't have a shared TLB at all. So they have a fully split instruction and data TLB, which is a bit of a problem because all of our previous Intel experiments relied on this shared component. But you know, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Uh, we did make some new experiments that didn't rely on this and managed to measure topology, set sizes and associativity, hash function bits and inclusivity. All right, so in conclusion, so we've uh, introduced desynchronization as a novel TLB reverse engineering primitive that allows us to um, measure TLB hits and misses with access granularity without relying on any timing. And this enables the yeah, new reverse engineering from software. Uh, we've developed experiments using desynchronization to reverse engineer various TLB properties, many of which were previously undocumented. Um, but we also confirmed the results of previous en reverse engineering work like TLBleed and, uh, and RevNC. Um, furthermore, we used the new reverse engineering results, uh, specifically the replacement policies, to better model this TLB behavior and um, we use this to, uh, to optimize adversarial eviction and obtain these uh, optimized eviction sets. And finally, use this uh, better method of eviction to improve TLB attacks using like drop-in replacements of their, um, their eviction loops. And uh, this much higher performance of eviction also enables uh, several new attack vectors.